They're arranged like this, and sure enough, it's a parasympathetic response. That's, this is under parasympathetic response, guys. Everybody hear me? The accommodation response is a parasympathetic response. Ciliary muscles innervated by parasympathetic cranial nerve number three. Did everybody hear me? We said parasympathetics, three, seven, nine, and 10. Everybody agree? Well, the parasympathetic of three is going to the smooth muscle of the eye. Two of the three mu smooth muscles of the eye. One of them being the ciliary muscle. The other one being the sphincter muscle of iris. All right? These two are connected to parasympathetic fibers that are being carried by cranial nerve number three. That's why this is an autonomic response. Sphincter muscle, when I, can, when I tell the sphincter muscle of the iris to contract, I get what? Pin, point, pupils. Why is that clinically important? Why is pinpoint pupils clinically important? <laughs> Did everybody hear what he said? No. It will determine whether someone is under the influence of something. You're working in the ER, you're an EMT, you get called to the scene. Kids, kids laying on the floor, pinpoint pupils, foaming at the mouth. What do you think he took? Heroin. Heroin. More than likely it's heroin. If it's not heroin, it's fentanyl. If it's not fentanyl, it's morphine. You understand? People are dilated or they're like No, pinpoint. Pinpoint. You know what that's telling you? That's telling you that the brain is being shut down. And parasympathetic will dominate in the eye because the brain is starting to shut down. So you gotta give them the reversal drug. That's this is one of the reasons why they're starting to prescribe the reversal drugs. To, to basically, to unprescribe the reversal drugs, to make them a, a very readily available, even to EMTs. So if an EMT comes on the scene, the reversal drug is there so that they can give it, because the moment you give the reversal drug, what it's doing, guys, wait, remember, remember, remember we talked about this, right? Remember, you guys need to know electrical physiology, right? Remember that you have from here to here, from resting membrane potential to threshold, you have EPSPs minus IPSPs, right? Well, sure enough, this is because the excitatory neurotransmitters versus inhibitory neurotransmitters. And the inhibitory neurotransmitters, well, sure enough, morphine can actually create an inhibitory effect on the brain. So it's almost as if you're increasing the number of inhibitory neurotransmitters. Well, one of the main ones is GABA. Huh? GABA is associated with chloride conductance. And chlorides are negative. So if I put more chlorides in, then I bring the resting membrane potential further down. That means I'm shutting down my neuron's ability to fire. The more neurons I take further down, the less neurons Fire. That means then more than likely the brain is less likely to respond. Does that make sense, guys? This is the effect of heroin, morphine, fentanyl. In high doses, when this drug is abused, it will suppress overall brain activity and kill the person. They can die from overdose because they shut their brain down. Once they shut their brain down, the heart does its own thing, the kidney does its own thing, nobody's really communicating and the brain's not really monitoring. Does you guys understand? Again, this is like you know sniffing bath salts. Does that sound like a good idea? Yeah, I don't know about you, but I'm not putting any ions up my nose. You follow? Why? Because the moment I put the eye up my nose, it goes into my bloodstream. You got me? The moment it goes into my bloodstream, it goes into it can affect the brain's normal electro 
chemistry. You really, you want to mess with your brain's electrochemistry? Is that is that what you really meant to do when you sniffed that bath salt? Yeah. Don't want to be sniffing bath salts. You don't want anybody to be sniffing bath salts. You got, that's why you got to explain it to them. Right? You sniff bath salts, all of a sudden, man, hey, it's like I, it's like I pot on a whole bunch of EPSPs. Next thing you know, I'm up here, I'm up here at my threshold, and I'm firing constantly in areas of the brain that normally are shut down. So I'm getting like epileptic seizures. Yeah? I'm losing consciousness. Oh, that's right, I forgot that I, I bit the dude in the neck. Yes. All right? Or I chewed his face off, that's what it was, right? I, I had no clue. Guys, do you understand what I'm talking about? Do you see? Because the brain is in this, and because the neurons that are in the brain are in this huge chemical soup, then, then you've got to deal with this whole thing of the, the neurotransmitters, the excitatory neurotransmitters versus the inhibitory neurotransmitters But well, it's not just about the neurotransmitters. It's about what? About their receptors. That's what we're talking about. The reversal drug. It doesn't work on the neurotransmitter. It works on the receptor. So you give that reversal drug so that it can play a game with the door. It's like a dummy key. You put the dummy key in the in the in the lock, then I can't use the real key, at least some of the time. Well, then that means then, uh, oh, then I don't get pinpoint people anymore. See? The people comes back to normal, reactive. Did everybody hear me? If, if a patient comes in and they have pinpoint pupils, non-reactive to light, Brainstem is being affected. Their brainstem is shutting down. You understand, guys? Why do I say the brainstem? Why the brainstem? Well, because what's what is the pupil's connection? Through cranial nerve three, right? And cranial nerve three is coming out where? At the midbrain. Did everybody hear me? at the level of the midbrain and the pons. That's brainstem. So when a patient comes in to pinpoint pupils, non reactive to light, you push that reversal drug, you assume that they took some kind of morphine. You don't even ask. And you push the drug. And you'll see the, pin, the, the pinpoint pupils, they'll reverse. And when you shine the light in their eye, It'll, it'll dilate and then constrict again. That's normal. Your eyes should be reactive to light. You see that? So when you get, when you get a patient, you, look at, and you shine the light in their eye. When you shine the light in their eyes, you go whoop. Take the light away, it comes back down. Shine it again. Shine it in this eye. Look at this eye. It goes whoop. Oh, wait a minute, I shine the light in this eye, not this eye. Ah, because they're both going to respond together. Make sense? Yeah, because they're, they're working as one unit for us to see. What's the reversal drug? Reversal drug is naloxone, suboxone, Narcan. 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 That's what they call it. The, the street name of it is Narcan. The drug name is naloxone, suboxone. It's a combination drug. And what it's doing is it's playing a game at the receptor level, guys. Now, you see why it's so important to understand neural? I understand. It's a lot. But that's why you want to come to class and let me give you my take on what the book is trying to give you, right? And focus in on the information. So, sorry, so there's, there's the eye, that's the, that's the core one. But what are we missing? We're missing another layer, aren't we? What's the third layer of the eye? The most important layer of the eye. Does anybody know? The retina. The retina. So now watch. I'm gonna use green for the retina. So the retina stops short.
and separately, then the retina actually breaks through. So, sorry, not, not there. I apologize. So if you look at where light enters, I know my drawing looks like shit, but where the image comes in through the cornea, hits the lens, the lens converges what you see, flips it upside down, and makes it left side. Upside down and left side right, because that's what any biconvex lens will do to any image. Don't believe me? Go get a biconvex lens and look at something through the biconvex lens. And when you look at it, you'll see it flips, flipped upside down and right side left. So our brains have to re-perceive and reassimilate us. <laughs> they have to reassimilate what the retina is receiving as completely being upside down and left side right. Did everybody understand me? And that's both left and right retinas. Huh? Sure enough, how do they do it? Oh, they do a rewiring game with the brain. <laughs> Separate of dropping off stuff to the thalamus. Everybody get me? Because remember, thalamus is the main sensory relay center. Yes? So, where the image falls on the back of the eye, it's referred to as the fulva centralis. And in the area of the fulva centralis is a concentration of a particular type of cell that we'll talk about now. So you're gonna get you'll get you'll get a kind of a dip there, and then over here, out of the way, you'll see that whole layer converge out to create cranial nerve number one. I mean cranial nerve number two. Did everyone understand it? So cranial nerve number two is nothing more, nothing less than the extensions of the cells of the retina. Did everybody hear me? So the green here, guys, this is my retina. And so this means that this is fluid filled, set. They call this the vitreous body, which is filled with vitreous humor. And vitreous humor is nothing more than fluid that comes from the blood vessel of the core. So we have, again, a way that we can filter blood of water and salt and glucose to fill the eyeball so it sustains a certain shape. Everybody understand? Now let's talk about that retina. Because we have the sclera, we have the cord. Now but I want to talk about the retina. The retina has several layers, but I only want to focus on four of those layers. The first of those layers is referred to as the pigmented epithelium. The pigmented epithelium will absorb all spectrums of electromagnetic radiation except what? Visible white light that it will reflect. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? We have the, the, the innermost layer of the retina that's in direct contact with the coral has the ability to absorb all of the electromagnetic radiation that we receive from the sun. Did everybody hear me? But reflect only the white light. Hmm. Interestingly enough. And it's reflecting it to feed it to whom? To the photo cell receptor layer. And that's where you have your rods and cones. And your cones are for light vision. And your rods, so, uh, yeah, your rods are for uh, night. So night vision versus day vision, color. Cones are for color and day vision, and rods are for night vision. So black and white. Mm -hmm. Contrast, depth perception. Okay? So pigment epithelium, photocell receptor layer. Now the next layer of the retina under the photocell receptor layer, which is rods and cones, 
Now, this is interesting, guys, because these rods and cones are actual, they're cells. They use a form of retinoic acid, which we get directly from vitamin A. They do a trans, they do it from cis to trans retinoic acid because of a double bond that exists within retinoic acid. And they use that as a, as a, as a signaling molecule, but the cells signal to the other cells only when they're hyperpolarized, interestingly enough. Only when they go from a, 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 a resting membrane potential that's more negative do they fire. And that makes these, these photo cell, that photocell receptor layer something special because they're the only neurons that we know of that are active when hyperpolarized. Everybody hear me? And again, they're using a form of vitamin A as their signaling molecule called transretinoic acid. And then that photocell receptor layer will perceive the light, the white light, and, and release neurotransmitter to the next layer. Everybody got me? So pigmented epithelium feeds the photocell receptor layer. The photocell receptor layer will feed the next layer. Okay? And that next layer is referred to as the bipolar cell region. Now guys, bipolar cells, everybody know what the bipolar cell looks like? If you don't, make sure you go back, make sure you know those cells. <laughs> the pseudo-unipolar versus the unipolar versus the bipolar neuron. Okay? You should know where you're gonna find those. Remember, pseudo-unipolar neurons make up the entire make, make up the entire sensory nervous system. They're derived from neural crest cells. Their job is to relay sensory information back into the brain and spinal cord. Bipolar neurons can be found in cranial nerve number one, which is found specifically in the ethmoid bone. They're responsible for relaying smell from the nasal cavity to the olfactory bulbs, which then relay it back through the olfactory tracts into the primitive brain and the thalamus, because the thalamus is the main sensory relay center. Everybody understand? Make sure you go over those outline, that outline I gave you, all right? I emailed it out to you guys to help you study. So now the bipolar cell region will feed the next cell layer, which is called the ganglion cell layer. And the ganglion cell layer, guys, is really, a, it's really interesting. The ganglion, from the ganglion cell layers, you're gonna get massive axons from this layer. All the axons from this layer. Everybody hear me? All the axons from this layer are going to converge to create the optic nerve. Did everybody hear me? So the optic nerve is, is the axons of the ganglion cell layer converging, diving through the sclera and the choroid. Did everybody understand me? And all this stuff happened very early on in embryological development because this is something special. Everybody follow? Now I already went over cranial nerve number one. That's for smell. You know that their, their bipolar neurons sit in the ethmoid, in the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone. And they'll, they'll capture molecules. And why? Because they have receptors that capture the molecules. And when they capture the receptors capture those molecules on the dendritic side, then that information gets relayed to the cell body. Cell body then has an axon hillock where it then calculates, hey, did I get enough excitatory neurotransmitter versus inhibitory neurotransmitter to fire? Oh, I got enough excitatory, I reach threshold, I go to max potential, boom, I get the depolarization across the membrane, it triggers voltage-gated channels, it gets to the axon terminal, triggers the calcium in internal flux, because of the voltage-gated calcium channels at the axon terminal. That allows for the vesicles to fuse, when calcium comes in, allows the vesicles to fuse, which would allow the release of neurotransmitter from the what? From the axon terminals of the olfactory nerves that are sitting in the cribriform plate of the ethmoid bone to release their neurotransmitters on the dendrites of the, of the olfactory bulbs that sit right on top. And then you got your olfactory tracts, we're going to relay it back into the brain. Okay? That's smell. It doesn't change, guys. 
Neurotransmitter release, still dependent, is calcium dependent. Do you understand? Didn't I, uh, didn't I mention this from the very beginning almost? Remember we talked about this. I said, this is the reason why you need to know chemistry. You need to know that calcium is important for five major things. The first is bones and teeth. The second is coagulation of blood. The electrical physiology, right? <clears throat> right? Of cardiac muscle. Remember the, the connection between myosin and actin, connectin and sliding of troponin out of the way? So in muscle contraction, you require calcium to be, right? It's calcium dependent event. But the most important calcium dependent event of all is the release of neurotransmitter, guys. This is why if you have a hypercalcemia or a hypocalcemia, you're gonna have issues with your brain and your, and your spinal cord and your peripheral nervous system. Does everyone understand that? You're gonna have things go haywire because your nervous system depends on calcium for the signals to be released by the cells that make it up. Do you understand? If I'm a cell, a nerve cell, and you're a nerve cell, and I wanna communicate with you, I can only communicate with you through neurotransmitter. That means you have to have the receptor and I have to have the molecule. But for me to release that molecule onto your receptor, I have to have calcium come in. Guys, do you understand that? The release of neurotransmitter is calcium dependent event. And this is why your brain is so well perfused with blood because it needs calcium to flow. Everyone understand?